But today we're going to give you the insider's guide to the equipment that will win one of these fellas the world title on Monday night, the cues themselves. I go to the timber yards that have got large stocks of, of ash and maple and I'll spend all day turning and turning, looking, looking at all the balls and come away with just a little pile. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm looking for, you know, the, the colour, the, the grain in the wood, the, the density and the weight. So from that, it'll become a, a square like this. Um, and you can see then where the grain's going on the wood. I'll then sort of look at each one. If it's any knots or blemishes, we can discard them at that stage. And then we start the, the rounding off process from there. So we'll leave the, the squares for a couple of months. Then we'll take it down to an oversize and again leave that for at least a month. From there, we then take it down again to the midsize, leave it again, and then from there to an oversized finish. We then weigh the shaft to see what the weight is because there can be quite a variation from one, one to the other just with the densities of wood. And then I'll, I'll, I'll check it over, decide on the grain, how rigid it is depending on what length the cue is going to be. I'll then look down to see what tip size someone wants, how heavy they want it, what length they want it. And I'll, I'll just find basically you know, the, the, the best one that, that will suit that. And then the, uh, that then becomes the shaft for that, that particular order and it, it will then go through to have the splicings and things like that done to it. The ebony is, is inlaid into the shaft uh, for two reasons. One, you get a nice smooth finish so it, it feels good in your hands. The other thing is it adds a natural weight to the cue. Uh, so basically we, we plane it down on, on two sides, glue ebony onto there and then it's planed down again into a, 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 a tapered wedge. The ebony is then glued onto, uh, glued onto those two sides and from there we then just, just plane that in by hand, keep, keeping turning that and as you can see the, the points are starting to develop from there so uh, you just plane that in, be careful not to take too much off in any one place. Um, and it's a case of keep checking that after quite a bit of planing, it will end up looking, looking like this with the nice distinctive points and, uh, and hopefully a round part that's uh, in line with the shaft. The butt has now been planed down and we're going to inlay, in this case, a piece of piccata, which is you know, quite a nice decorative wood. And I think we've probably got about 20 different woods that we can use of different colours and designs. Uh, and that will be glued onto there. And also to give it a, an extra feature, we've used the sandwich of veneers, which are very thin pieces of wood. Uh, they, these are maple and this is a stained sycamore to give a, a black line. The cues then cut to length and, and we cut a tenon on there to, uh, to accept a brass ferrule. The reason for that is, is twofold. One is it holds the wood together because it does get a battering with, with hitting the balls. So it, it stops it from splitting. So it's a sort of a safety collar for that. The other thing is once it's, it's on the cue, it does give it a, a nice solid base to, to, to glue the tip onto. Once the ferrule's on, the shaft is, is planed in to its final taper then and then it goes through sanding operations which is probably from start to finish about eight different sanding operations to get it into the sort of silky smooth finish that's uh, ready for then the, uh, the, the final finishing of it. Once we've done the final sanding on the cue uh, the, the, the tip goes on. Uh, it's important that you, you level the top of the ferrule and the back of the tip to give it a really good seating and then just dome it to its final final shape. The cue then gets uh, its oil finish, which is a few coats of, of linseed oil that we, uh, we put on there. That seals the shaft and protects it from the elements and it also has the effect of, of enhancing the grain and bringing out the, the natural colours within the wood and the, you know, the, the nice grain patterns appear. And then the final part is putting the flat on, which um, is a traditional thing to have the flat, but it's always nice because it means we can drill a hole in that to, to put our logo in. So the final touch is dropping in the logo. 
Well, I think John Paris has about, you were saying, maybe 60% of the I field. Think, I'm sure I heard that, which is, which is quite a large percentage um, of, of top snooker players to be using his equipment. I think he's, he's widely regarded as, as the best cue maker in the business. How, how many cues will a player go through in his playing lifetime, Stephen? Um, hopefully one. Um, a cue, it's not like tennis players who takes a, you know, they take a bag of rackets into, into the court and can use every one. A snooker cue is a very personal thing. Um, my own cue was, was a very... It was a rubbish cue, basically. I bought it off the rack when I was 12 or 13 and used it my whole career until it got smashed on an airplane. And I was never able to, to replace it. So hopefully you go through with, uh, with one cue your whole life. But a few of the players uh, tend to tinker. Yeah, exactly. There have been one or two. I know John Higgins tinkered a li little bit, and mm. uh, I think maybe Judd Trump's thinking of uh, of actually doing mm. uh, a change in his. But what prompts changes? Is it easier to change your game than it is your cue? And is that a more advisable solution in many respects? Um, my, my old coach, the late great Frank Callan, never liked the cue I was using because he said it didn't have enough power uh, to play like you know big deep screw shots from from one end of the table to the other. So some players might might want to change the game they want to play more shots um, and, and, a, and a stronger bit of wood will give you that more cue power um, some players might want to, to, to change the bigger tip from a smaller tip or vice versa um, so yeah it's it's usually not advisable I would say um, to, to tinker because you never stop once you start and you were actually guiding me through that feature because the the flat piece on the butt of the cue mm. you always like to have that but some players don't yeah some some players have the butt of the cue just round yep. um, but I used to play the flat would always be in the right hand side as I cued so I used to like to feel that when, when I would deliver the cue, um, but it's just preference purely. In a way, did that help you line up, in effect? Um, I, just, I just felt comfortable with, with having that on, on, on the palm of my hand, so okay. yeah, I'd say it's preference.